the strategy generally is that they declare a curfew. Then everybody stays at home. The army goes in there and mop up any bows and arrows and dengons that the local communities have to defend themselves. Immediately they are leaving. You hear gunshots. The jihadists come in, killing, raping, maiming. That has been the approach. Even during the lockdown under coronavirus, this is really what was going on. So I think General T. White and Juma has a point. And I can tell you, the late General Luka Yusuf, of blessed memory, former chief of Pakistan, he had reason to call one of his successors, an army chief of staff, he called him and almost slapped him. He told him, I wore this uniform before you. Hmm. I know what you are doing. You are the one giving uniforms and boots to these killers to come and kill my people. If you don't stop it, now me and you. Hmm. And during that, I can tell you, I will, for legal reasons, I will right. name the names. Right. The people are sitting right. around. Right. Right. They know them. Right. They know themselves. Then it stopped. The nonsense stopped. But look, let me take point by point because there's a lot of ignorance going on. Malang mm. Usman, look, fighting went on and there was a lot of fighting and youth blockaded the roads and did some nasty things. We don't approve of that. But if it is true, it is a Muslim attack, attack on Muslims. What has that got to do with land? What mm. has that got to do with land? Why don't you leave it on the sphere of just religious killings and so on? Why do you want our land? Why? Does it occur to you that anywhere you people settle, the place becomes a desert? I don't know whether you understand that. Anywhere you settle, that place becomes a desert. Look at history and look at geography of the world. Anywhere these people settle, the place becomes a desert. It becomes cursed without blessing. That's why you want other people's land. Please go back to your desert and leave my people alone. Please. Two. Adair talks about judgment. I agree with you. Judgment is coming because you cannot disembowel pregnant, expectant mothers. You cannot kill innocent children and elders. And their blood touches the ground. And God will not judge. Judgment is coming. Those people who have done this wickedness will carry their own shit with their own hands. Excuse, mm. excuse my language. It's right. the, time is, the time is coming. Mark my words. Obadiah is a minor prophet in the Jewish Old Testament. So mark my words. Judgment is coming. There will be the judgment of God, the judgment of history, the judgment of posterity, and the judgment of humanity. Obi, look, I've heard this thing, Obi, from Ejibo. I have Ndigbo friends, very dear friends. Yesterday, this weekend, Ohaneze Ndigbo leaders and Afenifere leaders and Pandev leaders from Niger Delta were all in southern Kaduna on a fact-finding mission. Mm. The peoples of the Middle Belt of southern Kaduna, we have a newfound solidarity with the south. Our destiny does not belong in the north. We are no more northerners, and we shall never be northerners. We shall either stand on our own or join the south. Mark my words. Mark my words. But, Paul, Obi, you are very wrong. What happened in the 60s? You cannot equate it to what happened today. And in fact, in the what people are saying is that it is a kind of nemesis. My father, I told you, was a, a reverend, a missionary, a right. pastor. Right. I remember as a child, he did so much to protect Igbo families. So many of them settled in my home as refugees, even on our farms. Mm. He did everything to protect them, to feed them until they nearly kill him and kill all his family for protecting Indigo. Mm. So it is not everybody 
that took part in that wicked enterprise, in that pogrom against the defenseless Indigo people. And I've always said it. This country will never be normal until we kneel down and ask for forgiveness from Indigo for the wicked sins we've committed against them. I wrote that severally. Some people from Yoruba land called me and said, ah, but there, if you know you've done something to Indigo, go and re repent. We didn't do anything to them. Leave us alone. Mm -hmm. That is the attitude of many people in the country. But you cannot equate the two. So because genocide took place in Turkey during the Ottoman Empire, because lynching took place in America, so we, the grand people that sent the slaves there, where if something happens to us, we're equally guilty, so it is okay. Obi, mark my words. When the finish was all, they will come to you. Don't think you are free. Wake up and smell the coffee. As for Mr. Paul, the role of the police, security, and stuff. Look, we have reason to believe that the full apparatus of the military is behind the banditry and violence because it is a global jihad. They are financing them. They are giving them uniforms. They are disarming our people and allowing them to come and kill and rape and maim. So Lieutenant General Teofilis Yakubu Denjuma is perfectly right. And let me make it very clear. Even my name, hmm. Obadiah in Jewish Old Testament means servant of the Most High God. Melafia means a man of peace. So I am by destiny the servant of God, servant of the people, and the man of peace. I abhor violence. If you could see my hands, I have never lifted my hands to commit violence, either in word or speech. Or action. I belong to the Martin Luther King School of Thought. But let me make it very clear. Our constitution protects the right to life. Right. It enshrines the principle of self-defense. So it is true of municipal law as it is of international law. Mm. International law and the law of nations gives a people who face an existential threat to their very survival the right and, in fact, the bounden moral duty hmm. to defend themselves, to defend their communities, to defend their church, and to defend their, 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 their families. No one can take that right away from them. Universal global ethics also gives communities the right to defend themselves. If the government, if the authorities are either unwilling or unable or both unable and unwilling to come to the aid and protection of these people. Which is, it, which is it for you, Dr. Badaya? Do you think the government is unwilling or unable to protect the people of Southern Kaduna? In fact... It is not only unable, it is unwilling, and we have good reason to feel that they are part and parcel of the killers. Let me make some revelations to you. That's a very big, al that's a very big allegation, Dr. Obadiah. The government is part and parcel of, of the killers. Yes. That, that's big. Yes. Yeah. Okay. How would the government just say, oh, it is revenge killing and so on? Then you leave it there. Oh, because it is revenge killing and so on and so forth. The body language of this administration the body language of the state government shows clearly that they have a hand in the killings. No doubt about it. Because, you see, General Abacha, hmm. and people don't give him his due. Do you think you would have tolerated such nonsense? General Abacha famously said that if an insurgency lasts for more than two days, the government knows... That is the real and the truth. And let me make some revelations because some of us also have our own intelligence networks. Okay. Okay. We have met with some of the bandits. We have met with some of their high commanders. One or two who have repented. They have sat down with us, not once, not twice. They told us that one of the northern governors is the commander of Boko Haram in Nigeria. 
Boko Haram and the bandits are one and the same thing. They have a sophisticated network. Mm -hmm. During this lockdown, their planes were moving up and down as though there was no lockdown. Moving ammunition, moving logistics, moving money, and distributing them in different parts of the country. They are already in the south, in the rainforest of the south. They are everywhere. They told us that when they finish these rural killings, they will move to phase two. The phase two is they will go into the urban cities, going from house to house, killing prominent people. I can tell you, this is the game plan. By 2022, they want to start a civil war in Nigeria. Don't joke with what I'm saying. I have a PhD from Oxford University. I'm a central banker. We don't talk nonsense. So don't joke with what I'm telling you. I have this from the highest possible authority, higher possible, higher authorities of some of the commanders of the killers and Boko Haram. You, you said you said northern governors, past or present, Dr. Badaya. No, current, current. Current. No, they said one of them is the commander of Boko Haram in Nigeria. One of them. And they are not looking for money. They have more than enough money. In fact, he told me they just came back from, from uh, one of the Middle East countries in private jet full of ammunition and dollars. Did they tell you, Dr. Yes. Badaya, why they would want to cause civil war in 2022? Yes, so that they can continue in power. Yes, yes, yes. I am the voice of thousands of voiceless people. Yes. 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 Oh, yes. Muslim youths have taken me as their voice. Yes. Christian youths have taken me as their voice. Yes, sir. Thousands of people have been killed in this country. Yes, sir. In Borno, in Yobe, in Adamawa, in Katsina, in Daura, in Birmingwari, in Zamfara, in Niger, in Southern Kaduna, in Benue, in Plateau, where we are today. I've mentioned Adamawa all over the country. Even the other day, a pregnant woman was killed in Bayelsa. I am the voice of the holy martyrs. Yes. And if I perish, hmm. I perish. The same thing. The fullness. And I'll tell you what happened last week. For the past three weeks, they had been killing people, over three, four hundred people in Miango, Rukuba. They were being killed. Then the other Saturday, they, they were going for mass burial. The Rukuba people, they are going to mass burial of I think about 60 or 70 percent of their people they are going to be buried on that day. Then they saw a strange bus coming in through the bush path. So the youth stopped the bus and there was an ambulance in front of it. So they started interrogating them. They said they are Yorubas and they just went for an Islamic conference in Bauchi. They are heading on their way back to Undo State. So the youth asked them, ah, if you are heading to Ondo State, when you, this is a bush path. Is it the road to Ondo State? The main highway passes through Jos Town behind, if you like, and passes through through Bukuru. You go. That is how you go to Ondo State. Why are you following this bush path if you are truly going to Ondo State? No, we must search this vehicle. When they opened the, the, the ambulance, they saw massive military hardware. They opened the bus, they saw people with guns and everything. So katakata started. And I think they killed, the youth killed about 60 of them. Now the propaganda is that innocent Yorubas were coming from Bauchi after a religious conference. They were going to Ondo and they killed them. When they released the list, none of the names was Yoruba. Name. They were all Fulanese. And don't forget, some years back, the Biron people were going for a mass barrier like that. And you know, this people are so funny, so heartless. They will not even allow people to moon their people. They went to Kuru. I'm talking to you. I'm in hiding. Right now, not even my wife knows where I live. Yes.
What they planned was that they will keep me there and interrogate me till past midnight. Then what they will then do is to say, look, it's too late to return me home that I should just stay in the prison next door. And they had already paid somebody who's on death row hmm. that in the middle of the night, he will just get up and kill me. Yes. So they told my wife, look, call Washington, call everywhere. And actually there was a call from the White House in fairness to the, 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 the Americans. There was also a call from London. There was a call from Germany. There's a call from France to Abuja to tell them that they warn them that they must make sure that no harm comes to me. And then when they saw the crowd, I think that is what then made them to backtrack. But they never quite gave up. And I praised some of the DSS people because they were very professional. They were very civil, but they were, of course, working under instructions. Right. And the people, their bosses, I think, had an agenda that I must be silenced at all costs. It's just that they looked at the scenario, they looked at, and then my son, uh, who lives in Brussels, he also addressed the media. He called London, he called the EU parliament. He even had a press media conference that was carried by channels. He didn't tell us, he just did it on his own. So the publicity over my case was such that they felt cornered. It became very difficult to them. Now, over a month ago, uh, they tried to bomb my house. Some people called me and uh, said I had a parcel from the United States and they needed to deliver it to my house. I should give them the address. Uh, I hesitated and, uh, you know, but I, I got wins that, you know, it was not a good, it was not really a parcel, uh, something else behind it. And, uh, but I would have still sent people, but at dawn, the morning in which I was supposed to go to take delivery, I dreamt and I saw that my whole house had, my whole house had crashed with everybody inside, including myself. It was like a warning dream. When I, then that dream came, I said, ah, I think the almighty must be telling me to be careful with this thing. So I decided to switch off my phones for two days. They've never called me to this very day. <laughs>